Do you want to make a difference in the world? And see the lives of the people of India and all internationals transformed with the gospel? As India goes, all Asia will go with Living the Dream podcast provides tools for you to pray, give, and go as you become an active participant in the Great Commission and help your church's demographic represent the demographic of your community. Get ready to find your strategy for reaching your community and changing the world here at Living the Dream Podcast with your host, Pastor Kevin. Good morning. I'm Pastor Kevin, founder and executive director of Global Hope India and your host for Living the Dream Podcast. This is where the church gathers to mobilize in order to effectively reach the community and change the world, including all the foreign-born internationals moving into our communities. I interview today's top church leaders from around the world so we can learn all we can about reaching internationals with the gospel and partnering with them in the Great Commission. It's time the church has this conversation. Go to globalhopeindia.org forward slash resources for tools for your success. Now let's jump into today's show. I am so excited for today's show. Just wait until I introduce you to Pastor David. He was born in Mexico City and has lived in North Carolina since 1999. From the time he was born, he was international. His parents are from Peru. His girlfriend is from the Dominican Republic. David holds a bachelor's in arts in piano and a bachelor's in science and biology from Campbell University. He also holds a master's in management studies from Duke University. David and his father are both on staff at the Point Church under Pastor Chris Hankins. Pastor David is the executive director of the Espanol ministry. He is the worship leader there of the Espanol church. He's also the worship leader of the International Fellowship and the worship leader of the English Church Meeting in Chapel Hill for the Point Church. David also assists Central Worship Director and Mission Support for the Point Church. Now, David loves football. He calls it football. We call it soccer, but he loves it. David, welcome to Live in the Dream podcast. Hi, thank you, Kevin. You got the last name correctly, so Uh, thank you for that, too. (laughs) I apologize if I butcher it during the show. but No, it was perfect. Yeah, so you are my brother from another mother, born in Mexico City, now living Mm -hmm. in North Carolina. Can't wait to share your story with everyone. As a show, we really champion what God gave us in Revelation 7, that vision of the church uh, being a representation of every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every language. Thank you for being on the show today. Share with us about your family and how you got to North Carolina. Okay, well, thank you for having me on the show. I I know that you guys are doing great work and hopefully people will be blessed by what they hear today. Mm -hmm. I was born in Mexico City. My story is really a story of not belonging really anywhere Mm. because my parents, both of them are Peruvian. Mm-hmm. They were born in Peru, and my dad came to Mexico when he was 19 years old, and he came to study. He was called into ministry, and he then went back to Peru to study. It's a long story. He has a really impactful testimony. Mm. But then he met my mom in Peru as well, and then they they got married in Mexico. Also, her story is kind of amazing but they came they lived there for well my dad 21 years my mom like 19 and that's where i was born so when i was born not like 100 percent mexicans mexican because mexicans really are you know very nationalistic like Mm -hmm. like any country so i remember being little and like people saying, oh you're not mexican enough you're peruvian and so i never really felt like i was home anywhere and when i went to peru to visit my family because almost all my family lived there Mm -hmm. and they would say oh you're the mexican because my accent was different i spoke differently so it was like a story of yeah not really belonging and then 
God opened the door. So when my, my mom came to Mexico, she came to teach at a school, bilingual school, of people that were that had means. In Mexico, there's a, a, a big stretch between people that have means and people that don't. So God just opened that door. So that's the world kind of I was born in. And my dad also was pastoring a church with people of me, kind of the world I grew up in. And the school was bilingual, so I was able to learn English from really a very early age. So I came to the U.S. when I was 15 years old, and that was through my mom's work as well. She was invited to teach Spanish here in the U.S., and God guided that because they said a lot of people would when they're invited to teach in the U.S., they would do the research and be like, oh, this is the best place to go. This is the best city and the best opportunities are here. But what they said was, let's pray. And the first person that calls us, the first principal from the U.S. that calls us, that's where we're going to go. Wow. And that's what they did. So this program is visiting, it's called Visiting International Faculty. I think the name has changed now because it's been so long. But mm-hmm. They bring international teachers from all over the world to just enrich the experience of public school students here in the U.S. So my mom was selected. That was another kind of God thing because they usually select uh, single people, but she was selected with a family and everything. So Mm -hmm. we came originally for three years, but my dad was invited to plant a church here. And that's kind of how our journey to stay here started and also in three years i was eligible to go to college so i applied to campbell and that was another miracle they accepted me as an in-state student even though i didn't have the necessary requirements yet i was able to get in and i studied there pre-med and music i've always played piano i, I started when i was four mm-hmm. and that, that has been really my passion i used to to do music and I went to the National Conservatory of Music in Mexico City when I was 12. It's a very prestigious school. And then when I came here, I continued studying with the chairman of the keyboard department at ECU. Mm -hmm. My mom was very proactive in in seeking so my instruction would continue. And then I went to Campbell to study music. But the reason I mention all that is because when I came here, we came to a very rural part of North Carolina. It's called uh, Seven Springs. It's near Goldsboro, Mount Olive. It was very different from like kind of the world I knew. It's people, you know, that what were immigrants here and they were having to work in the fields, in factories, in processing, like pig processing or chicken processing. That's the, that's the people God brought us into minister to. Mm-hmm. So that was a very different, like huge change for me. And I think God also had that in mind because he helped me be with another very different group of people from all over, not just Mexico, but like Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and all over Central America. And wow. kind of that broke my biases because growing up, I mean, not that your parents teach you this because mm-hmm. they are always very open, but just the world I was in was very different from the world I found myself in here. And and I, I, I had those barriers to break and God, I think was very intentional in bringing me here to this rural part of the U S and with this different group of people, he was preparing the way I know that now for what I am doing now, because even then I was learning about many cultures, many different realities so what happened then is i i went to college i was going to be a doctor Mm -hmm. that's what i wanted to do Mm -hmm. but on the journey i found that's not really what i wanted to do i wanted to help people but not in that way because honestly i didn't love the fact that i had to spend most of my time dictating and behind closed doors and not really with people Mm -hmm. So my passion was really to help people in a deeper way. So another door opened up and I ended up going to Duke to study business, which by like, really, I don't have any kind of business acumen like other people do naturally, like my brother. Mm 
mm-hmm. but but I went there and it was a, another different experience, another group of people that I learned a lot from. In that process, I was called because I've been serving in my dad's church in the church we planted all that time. Mm-hmm. But I was I felt the calling of God to go to a, a church that was in English, so I could lead in English. I never. Oh, by the way, I, I was leading worship all that time. Right. Uh, that's kind of what I, I, I did, and so I felt the call to lead in English and grow myself. I had been really pouring into people there, and uh, teaching, and uh, we even recorded an album with people just when I was like nineteen or twenty to, to really help um, get funds for a sound system. So we were able to do that. But anyway. That's great. I wanted to grow myself, so mm-hmm. I kind of was looking, and then I got a, a, this phone call from from Chris Hankins, and that's when everything started here at the point. That was around 2013, and he invited me to take a step of faith. At that in that moment, the church was just two churches, one in the Mission Valley Theater right. near NCSU, and mm-hmm. the other one was in the Apex Middle School. Yeah. It was hard work and everything that that I had comfortable was kind of taken away because now you know, nobody knew me. I wasn't like the pastor's kid. I, it was a new environment. I had to kind of learn a lot of new things. And again, I didn't feel like I belonged there either. But it was another learning experience. And as Chris has a passion for church planting, just like my dad. So when they met, Mm-hmm. It was kind of a match made in heaven, and they decided to to start this Spanish work. And as things have grown, I found myself even more as a bridge. Mm-hmm. And somebody said something that kind of stuck with me, and it is that a bridge gets walked on by both sides. Mm-hmm. So I've I've felt that in my life a lot here in the U.S., but I've never felt it as much as when I came to the point. Mm-hmm. Because there's two different cultures, two different ways of working, my dad and and really point leaders. And so that was interesting. And then as things have grown, Chris really had a heart for planting churches in different languages with right. different cultures. So I've been able to help with that. And right now we have an international church led by Pastor Sammy Jew, who is amazing. And mm-hmm. if you haven't uh, interviewed him, I would highly recommend yeah. that you do. Cause he's, he's scheduled he's to be really interviewed. He's really awesome. Yeah. And I want to yeah, interview really your awesome. father as well. And uh, I look forward to that. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah, I would have to translate for him. But mm-hmm. yeah, I would love to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's back up just a little bit. Congratulations on holding two bachelor's degrees, one in piano and one in biology. And mm-hmm. you shared you shared some of that. But I'm, I'm just curious, when at what age did you begin to know that you had been set apart for the Lord's work? Well, I think that was since I was little. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it with this anecdote. My when I was in maybe preschool, I remember being like five or six. And I remember this distinctly because I was so kind of taken aback. We were in a little circle with my classmates and they were all asking, the, the teacher asked all of us, How, what did your dad do? So everyone was saying, my dad is a lawyer and I don't know what he does, but he's a lawyer. My dad is a doctor. My dad is an engineer. My dad is an architect. And when they came to, came to me, I literally said, my dad does nothing mm. because he's a pastor. Mm-hmm. Because I thought it was the most natural thing for us to serve God and to be in, in service to him. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was just part of life. I didn't know it was a job. And I still feel like, like that. I, I don't feel like what I do is really a job. It's just serving God is what we all do. Maybe, yeah. maybe in different ways. Maybe if you're not in full-time ministry, you're a teacher in a school. And you're serving God by loving those kids. Mm-hmm. Or you're attending at a, as a physician you're loving people or you're you know doing many different things you're loving people where you are and you're doing ministry so i feel like it's it's been like that in my life every time i served god was just a natural thing that i did and when i got out of business school when i ended up kind of not knowing exactly what to do i, I just felt god saying you should look for an english church and 
for you to grow and to serve me. And that's kind of what I did. And I applied to different churches, but the only church or the only pastor that called me was Chris. And when I heard his vision, it really resonated with me about planting churches and being a church that's not about buildings, that's not about anything else other than serving people and helping them find their way back to God. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really resonated with that. And especially with the fact that I felt like he was open to everyone. That's not, that has not been my experience. That had not been my experience in the, in the, my previous church where, where we planted the place where we planted. So mm -hmm. felt like, he had a heart for everyone and so that's that's also what attracted me and so i just feel like it's something natural that god really always had a plan for me to to serve him and i'm thankful to be doing it in this way now wow there's so much i want to unpack of what you're saying there let me first of all just congratulate you that you have a master's in management studies from duke university why did god bless you with such incredible education and that led up to this opportunity to work at Point Church? Well, like I said before, I think he prepared the way every step of my life, every season of my life to really prepare me for what I'm doing now because I feel like I'm using literally everything mm -hmm. I've, I've learned. Well, maybe a little bit of biology now that we're in this kind of pandemic thing that mm -hmm. people have questions, but I think that he is the one that's drawing people to himself. So he's the one that wants to reach people. So when you have a, an open heart and an open mind, I think that's what God wants. He is not looking for people with any kind of specific knowledge, but he prepares you for or and equips you for the work that he has. So in my case, right now, I am acting as something called executive director which a lot of people just call executive pastor but i am really in charge of leading these four churches we planted in terms of administration in terms of execution of things in terms of strategy in terms of leading our our pastors really because my dad does more of a pastoring more of caring that's his his strength is mm -hmm caring for people he's i i call him a uh, heart with legs because mm -hmm. he's just full of love full of commitment to people and he will never ever let a, a sheep go astray without chasing it to the fullest extent wow. where my heart is it's big too but I, I i've found myself talking with him like oh man that's so hard i can't do that but he he really loves people so for me it's more about strategy, about leading different teams and leading things like from social media to kid point to our strategy with life groups, finding places, finding resources, finding partnerships. That's where I'm using all, all the admin stuff, the executive kind of stuff and uh, leading those kind of things. And, and, and I'm also obviously using the music and I love music. I love being creative. And that's really what fuels me. And I love leading worship. And I love worshiping with people and seeing them uh, worship. And now, I mean, it's such a, an amazing thing to you know, sing in Spanish, but also sing in English and also sing in different languages. So in international, we sing in maybe four or five different languages every Saturday. Mm -hmm. And it's been really cool to learn to sing in Swahili and to sing in Hindi and to sing in Korean, to sing a little bit in Chinese and Arabic. And so it's been really cool. And I, I, again, I just feel like it's nothing about me or special about me. It's really just God using his people for the work of equipping the saints for ministry. I want to just connect some dots here between the two of us in that you were born you said early in your sharing of your testimony that you really did not belong anywhere. <laughs> you were born in Mexico. You ended up in the USA, but you have Peruvian parents. At what point did you begin to realize that the church is not a Mexican church or a white church, but it is a multinational church? It is global. It is for all people. You said later that when you got to Pastor Chris, you saw that this was really one of the first 
um, exposures of leadership that was open for everyone. And, Mm -hmm. and yet, you know, you do share that your father has had that heart and you've been exposed Mm -hmm. to that, but where, when, when did you realize that the church is, is really multinational and is to be open for everyone? I feel like God revealed that to me very, very young. So I came to faith when I was six years old. I know that uh, a lot of people say that, but I really understood the gospel when I was six. It was I was in a place where I was really behaving badly. I, they had to take me out of the school where I was and put me in another school because I was so badly behaved. And I remember hearing the gospel, and, and that really changed me. So... When I was really young, I remember loving to sing a hymn in Spanish. I, I'll just translate it. It's called Let All the World Sing to His Name. It was number six on the Baptist hymnal in Spanish. Mm-hmm. But I love to sing that song. And it really kind of sang all the world, all the world. And I felt like God was so huge. And that's what also my mom also taught us, that God, we have a great God who is has everyone in his sights. And the cool thing in, in Mexico, we had a lot of missionaries come from the U.S. And also because my parents are Peruvian, we had people from South America and a lot of different cultures come and, and, and share from the word of God. And so I saw that from an early age again, that there were people following Jesus and being the church all over the world. Mm-hmm. Also, when I was... 10 years old my parents went to singapore to a conference to an institute called Hagai institute mm-hmm. but multicultural multi-ethnic experience over there yes uh, and and they came so pumped i mean i remember them even my dad talks about every time he gets even now that's been years so mm-hmm. that was kind of my experience just knowing that god was active in Australia, he was active in Africa and Asia, and hearing about missionaries, hearing about the work that he was doing in South America. Also, my dad was also invited to to preach really in a lot of places. He went to Cuba like three or four times in the Fidel era back in the 90s. He went to Brazil, to obviously Peru, to other places in Central America. Mm -hmm. He also traveled Mexico, so I was able to go with him to we lived in Mexico City, but I went to like the border with the U.S. a couple of times. And so I was able to be exposed to many different cultures. So it was something that I feel God revealed. And I never really had a, an, a view of the church as being just, you know, unilaterally Mexican experience. So, so when you talk of your family, you... Uh, the listener could easily think, well, okay, well, David's family is obviously rich. I mean, listen to how much his father has traveled. Listen mm. to how privileged they have been to move to America and to have all of this fine education. So what is the economic status of your family? Would you consider yourself growing up very affluent and, and with, within a rich family? Or do you look back and just see the providence of God, miracle after miracle, to really just favor your your father for his his faithfulness to the gospel? Mm. Well, thank you for that question. It's a very good question because I was just talking about this with with someone the other day, and the reality is, my dad grew up ex- like in extreme poverty. In mm. in, in a, he has nine brothers and sisters, and my. My grandpa worked as a truck driver and my mom's side, my mom also grew, grew up in uh, very simple means. My, my grandma was a single mom and she raised four kids by herself as a seamstress in Peru. And what they both had in common, my grandma and my grandpa from my dad's side, and his wife too, my, my grandma, is an extreme faith in God. Just they, I call them heroes of faith because... They were ostracized by their families for believing in Jesus. And that's an experience that happens to a lot of Hispanics. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people from other other countries mm-hmm. where you believe in Jesus, you're really saying, uh, giving your back to the traditions and the customs of your parents and grandparents. So it's really an insult to your family, to a lot of people, until they realize and God 
does that in in his time that Jesus is the answer and he he transforms their heart but but that was their reality they they grew up in, with almost nothing living day to day mm-hmm. and when they came to to Mexico it was because they were seeking a better life just like a lot of people come to the US right now in these years or have come in, during the year so when they came to Mexico they had really nothing they wow. didn't have any family here they only the and that's been my also my my reality is i never belonged anywhere but the only place i would belong was with the people of god and so my my true colors are just the colors of the cross so when i, I saw that. that and going going to that school it was just god's op- god opening the door because we would i they would have never been able to pay for that the tuition there i mean it was stratospheric i had a full like a full ride scholarship to go to that school because my mom was a teacher and she was such an amazing teacher. And that's another thing that God really helped my parents excel, not because of the means they had, but because they loved him and they loved people. So I was able to have a full ride. And, and then they, I remember they gave us to pay like 5%. And even then it was such a struggle to be able to, to, to uh, pay that 5%, mm-hmm. it was a huge struggle. Mm-hmm. And when I went to middle school, because that school only went to elementary school, they I got a scholarship there too. And my brother also was in, in scholarships. And so God just prepared everything. God was there with us. It wasn't, I mean, I, I again, I say I didn't belong, not just because of the country of origin, but also because of the means. I mean, my friends had, Lamborghinis and had huge houses, but uh, we we didn't even at some points didn't have a phone. Mm. Uh, didn't have, I mean, we had very old cars. We had it was a struggle to find. We had to f- buy uniforms and we had to really take care of them. Mm-hmm. And so it was a uh, it was that kind of a thing. And then when we came to the U.S., it wasn't that we had the means to come. It was that that program was was there and my mom applied just because it was getting really violent in mexico city it was very very hard to mm-hmm. to scrap by for us and they they knew they would have to also pull us from those schools to go to to uh, public schools when we graduate our respective schools so they they were praying and god provided this avenue for us to come and even when we came i was only able to go to, to college because Obviously, God provided for that, and my mom worked so hard. But at the same time, I also got scholarship of music, mm-hmm. of academic scholarships. I got to Campbell. My brother also, he went to Duke, and God always always provided for us, and it wasn't easy. I mm-hmm. think my mom did a lot of sacrifice. My dad, being a pastor, you don't ever get a lot of income, but God provided. She's she's a teacher, so. Mm-hmm. Being, being a pastor's kid and teacher's kid, I, I can say that God has been faithful. Praise the Lord. And now, a story from the mission field. So let me tell you a story of having surgery in Mumbai. I am uh, welcoming one of our senior adult teams into India, into Mumbai. And we are at the Mumbai airport, and they have carefully brought over two 50 pound suitcases each full of supplies and resources that we are going to be distributing during their week of ministry and they are senior adults and i'm a big strong healthy man and i'm thinking let me serve them by putting these suitcases over the back seat of the bus and so i'm in behind the bus on the ground and i'm lifting one by one these suitcases over my head i've done it many times i've never had any issue and I begin to feel nauseous but I don't think a whole lot about it and I'm just thinking it's hot um, India's hot it's it's balmy it's steamy so I'm just thinking okay I'll drink some water I'll feel better well I continue throughout the night and into the next day to feel uh, this sense of nausea and one time I I just began to uh, massage my stomach and I noticed that there's this bulge at my belly button 
and I, and if I push that bulge in, the nausea goes away. But as soon as I relieve the pressure and it comes back out, then um, then I'm beginning to feel nauseous again. And I'm walking up toward our partner there in India. We're arriving uh, at a at a ministry program, and he looks at me and says, "Pastor, what's wrong?" And I said, "I'm I'm not doing well. I feel very nauseous." And, um, and I think, I think maybe I've developed a, a, a hernia and, and so I'm perplexed, you know, I'm just arriving in India the summer. I still have a lot of time. I, I go to Chennai next and, and I'm, I'm not sure do I, what do I do here? And so, uh, two doors away from this, uh, ministry program is a surgeon and he calls his friend and ask and the surgeon is like 20 minutes away uh, from arriving at his home and he says uh, send him over in in 20 minutes and I'll take a look at him I I go in and uh, the surgeon takes a look and he says yep um, you have a hernia and it's not going anywhere it needs to be repaired you need you need surgery you need mesh and so we start talking about all the, all of the logistics I'm I'm messaging home I'm calling uh, my wife and and messaging our kids and everything Thing. Within five hours, I am ha having laparoscopic surgery uh, to repair a, a, a belly button hernia in India in a private office there in a surgical room uh, of this surgeon and they bring over the robotic arms and I am having the surgery and I wake up the next uh, day or after the surgery, I go home the next day and I am back at the hotel and uh, within um, a day of recovery, I am back with the team and I am so thankful that I had that surgery and I just see it as God's provision. It was much cheaper than it would be in the USA. Uh, I never reaped any consequences or repercussions from it. I've only known uh, health as a result, um, but it was uh, funny how uh, this happened on a mission trip and how God provided. And to think that this senior adult team turned into grandmas and grandpas for me as they lovingly took care of me and they made sure that I would not leave that hotel the day after my surgery. They forced me to stay back and they just um, went on and, and went through the program. Of course, our, our partners there and our other staff took very good care of them, um, but I recovered and the next week I was on a flight over to Chennai and it was uh, just an incredible provision of the Lord. What a great story from the mission field. We want to give some local love to our friends at Selling to Give. They align their profession of serving clients, buying or selling a home with their passion to impact and transform lives. They donate the first fruit of every home sold through their Selling to Give Foundation to support local and global ministries. We salute David and Amanda Williams from Selling to Give for their generosity and gospel impact. Check out their website at sellingtogive.com. Want tools to help increase the effectiveness of your church's efforts to reach the internationals in your community? Global Hope India has 20 years experience and wants to share our successes and failures with you and your team through resources like this podcast and those offered at globalhopeindia.org. Reach out today. Know your numbers. Maybe you've seen the show Shark Tank and you've seen the business owners come in to pitch to the sharks and explain why they're the right person to execute the vision for their business. Well, we believe that you are the right person to execute the vision for your church and you need to know your numbers. I want you to remember as we talk about know your numbers, we're talking about know the number of souls that Almighty God has created and loved and sent his son to die for. Let's talk about the ethnic groups. There's five major ethnic groups. The first is whites. 70% of whites identify themselves as Christians. 79% of blacks identify themselves as Christians. Only 34% of Asians. This is 4.6 billion Asians on planet Earth. Only 34% identify themselves as Christian. 77% of Latinos identify themselves as Christian. And mixed ethnic groups 
64% of them identify themselves as Christian. Christ is being made known among the whites, among the blacks, among the Latinos, and among the mixed, but it is very slow in progressing the gospel among the Asian community. We've got work to do. Know your numbers. Well, I'm about to finish a manuscript on a book currently entitled Audacious Generosity, and you're, you are describing what I have been led of God to write in that book, that if we will, if we will allow God to give us more and we will be pure hearted with that to use it for his glory, to set it aside for his glory, there's no limit to what God can do in and through us. And you're testifying of that for, on behalf of your parents and Mm -hmm. praise God that he is that, that heavenly father that wants to give good gifts to his children. And yet what you share is that your whole focus has been the gospel and Mm -hmm. the, the great commission. Your father will do anything that he can to leave the 99 and go after the one and just continuously be the heart of God in front of lost people, people that are far from God. Mm -hmm. So let me just connect the dots here because I think this is a fascinating account of of just really proclaiming that God is on the move. So yes. I grew up in North Carolina. Pastor Chris grew up here as well. And we, mm-hmm. in our lifetime, saw churches, white churches that denied access to blacks to come in and worship. Mm-hmm. And this was years ago, but I've been exposed to that in my, in my lifetime. And so God is definitely on the move. And there, the, the church in the U.S., I've heard it in my lifetime, that the most segregated hour in the United States is at 11 a.m. Sunday morning when, yes. when the church is so divided uh, between blacks and whites. Well, by the grace of God, we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go. But there is an even greater shift just when you think, okay, well, well, God is accomplishing what I, I see him doing as far as mixing blacks and whites together. Here he comes and says, but this still is not the true gospel. The true gospel is everyone, every nation, mm-hmm. every tribe, every tongue. And so it's I see him very intentionally bringing the church more and more to that multinational level, mm-hmm. every church. Not just a few churches here and there, but every church. And, and so what you are describing is that here he, in his sovereignty, David's born in Mexico City, is exposed his whole childhood and teen years into multinational move of God and, and that the, the cross is for everyone, the gospel is for everyone, mm-hmm. and then lays it on Pastor Chris's heart to plant churches that are very different from the status quo in North Carolina at that time. And that this movement, this church planning movement is to be for everyone and then connects the two of you together. There's no small act of God to do that Mm -hmm. and to bring your father and Chris, Chris's hearts together and, and you here as well. And now you are uh, executive director over the Espanol Church at Point. You're the worship leader at Espanol. You're the worship leader for the international congregation. You're the worship leader for the English congregation in Chapel Hill. You assist in central worship director and mission support. And you're you're about a movement of God to fulfill Revelation 7, 9, mm-hmm. 9 through 12 of every tribe, every tongue, every nation. What are you seeing God do? in your perspective, to to really bring the gospel to everyone? God is on the move, like you said. And the the thing about segregation or kind of biases, I mean, it's not only race, but it's also culture. It's also economic, socioeconomic, it's also yes. educational. So what I saw in Mexico because of the, the kind of the environment I was in was, was that as well. I mean, a lot of people being just disregarded or rejected because of of where they came from or the the money they had they didn't have i mean i was fortunate maybe because i looked a certain way or but i didn't have the money either so god kind of showed me very that very early on and, and my grandparents and and my parents really guided me in that but there's also that going on here and even with hispanics here so god has really showed me that he wants 
to eliminate all that. And he's on the move. He's drawing people from every race, every country, every culture, social and ethnic origin uh, towards himself. And so he's connecting people with the knowledge, the resources, the expertise to enable us to be an outreach to to people that are marginalized or that may have not been accepted before. And he's mobilizing us to as a church to become much more aware and and active in multiculturalism, I believe, than ever before. Mm -hmm. And so I I think God's showing us that um, also that being aware, just knowing is not enough because it takes really intentionality Mm -hmm. to become a multicultural and diverse church. Uh, I mean, from being willing to lay down our preferences Mm -hmm. and our comfort and uh, in our cultural, in cultural terms or, in the way we worship in order to be effective in reaching others mm-hmm. um, because it's not just about having you know, a conference say, once a year or or an event once a month or mm-hmm. going to serve once a week it's, it's success in this aspect of, of mini- it, uh, really in what jesus called us to be in the church that's for everyone is the success only comes from what what someone called tabling so the act of establishing real and deep relationships with those in our communities who are different from us mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so i've seen like the visions like sammy jew's vision of the 21st century moses and mm-hmm. my dad and chris's vision that i would sum up in paul's saying i've become everything to everyone in order to save at least some and the value of collaboration accelerates multiplication. I've seen these type of visions kind of synergize in a beautiful way to create something that, I mean, it's in process still. I mean, it's not perfect, but I think it's really getting us closer to God's dream for the church. And that is that we reflect his glory. And his glory is not one color or one. I mean, he created us because that is the expression of his creation and his glory so we're called to reflect that and Mm -hmm. and and we're also called to his dream that is that no one may perish but have everlasting life Mm. yeah david are there any current statistics that really make your heart pound for the lord any anything that you're seeing related to the numbers of foreign-born internationals from around the world that are moving into our communities god's just keeping in front of you to tenderize your heart for this move of reflecting god through the church well i'm not i don't have a specific i know that a lot of people are moving to the triangle every day and Mm -hmm. a lot of them are are international i mean in i go to morrisville and i I mean it's a lot of people from india there Mm -hmm. and uh, i go to certain places here in the triangle and it's like a lot of spanish speakers and there's places where it's a lot of africans and refugees so i i looked up a little bit of numbers but i didn't really find one specific i found one that as in from the census bureau that says and as of 2017 7.0 Seven seven point eight percent of the U.S. population was foreign born, mm-hmm. and North Carolina ranks tenth in the nation for the number of refugees settled mm-hmm. here. Yeah. So that's from the North Carolina Institute of Medicine. So yeah, I mean, there's so much need, and I know that I know it because I see it. We mm-hmm. have at the Point Church right now five food pantries, but we see people from Egypt, Afghanistan, from places like Congo, everywhere, coming for for various reasons here. Mm-hmm. And they, they need the gospel more than anything else. Mm-hmm. You've shared several passages. Is there any others that you'd want to share with us that where God has really taken you and his word to continuously pound in your heart his love yeah. for the nations? Yeah, I think Galatians 6, 9, it says, let us not become weary of In doing good for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so I feel like we're playing the long game here. This is not something that happens quickly. It it might take a whole generation for us to get this right, but Mm -hmm. I believe it will happen first with faith and, and not being weary, but also being united. 
being willing to collaborate, being intentional, but more than anything, being in a relentless pursuit of God's voice and intimacy with him, because that's really what help our heart, helps our heart beat uh, along with his. Uh, we, we, we start caring more about what he cares about than about what we care about. And really breaking the status quo in terms of what we're used to and what our parents were used, was used to. I mean, that takes that takes courage and that takes a relentless faith. And mm -hmm. honestly, I admire the churches that are doing this, especially Americans that see that and, and that God God uses to break these barriers because it's a hard thing. I, thankfully, in my life, I, I I had it easy in those terms because kind of my parents already had this 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 view and this perspective but a lot of people have to like my grandparents kind of break with their families or break with with tradition and that's a hard thing so mm -hmm. i really encourage everyone that might be listening that to not grow weary of of doing good because god will use it in many different ways to for his glory and for people to come to his his throne from every race ethnic origin background culture and that's really what the church is supposed to be to to be the reflection of the glory of god yeah amen amen well before we close out the episode i'd really love you to just speak to fellow gospel workers around the world particularly here in the usa brothers and sisters in christ that just you have an opportunity to just encourage them you've 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 talked some pretty big words as far as unity, being relentless in our pursuit of God, breaking from tradition. Let's say that someone's listening today and they're like, okay, I'm beginning to feel very convicted here. And, and, and I do want to be a leader, a kingdom leader. I want, I want to, I want to represent that uh, my God is for everyone. And I want to be a leader in that movement that the church is no longer my my house of worship, but it is a multinational global church. And I want to join that church. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a leader in that. What words of encouragement do you have as far as just leading and, and taking the gospel to the nations and fulfilling what we read in Revelation 7, 9 through 12? Amen. Well, first of all, thank you. I, I recognize that it is a challenge, so it's not easy. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is what I've discovered is that God wants to do a work in us first. So he, he really starts everything with what happens inside of us. So if, if someone's feeling this, it's, it's not from me or from you. It's God really touching their hearts and their lives. So something that I really champion is being intentional about letting God do that work in us and then acting on it. So seeking to fulfill that calling it, it can be pretty simple so we have to go out of our way it i would say simple in understanding it's difficult in action but really we have to go out of our way to really get to know people both internationals or people from other ethnic and cultural or origins so Mm -hmm. I would say go out of your way to meet someone. I mean, and then have conversations, simple things that that you would do. One one thing that really unites us is our our interest in hearing each other's stories. Mm -hmm. So you can ask, you know, what's your name? How did you come here? What's your story? Why did you move here? How how are things where you came from? What's your favorite food? Can we have that? I mean, I think people really unite over food as well. That's why. In, both in Espanol International and in our Urdu church as well. I know our Korean church also, like we do a lot of food because that really helps us to to come together. And, and there are other harder questions you can ask, like how can I serve you? Mm -hmm. Could I visit with you? That's, that's a big one. That's the tabling thing aspect that I was saying. Do you want to get, get together sometime? So I would say those those conversations can really carry you into a place where you maybe never thought you would be and mm -hmm. god will open those doors and yeah. i would say if you don't know where to meet people that are different from you an easy way is to go to a church service where there are 
many plenty of people internationals and mm -hmm. i mean you can come check out point international on saturdays at four mm -hmm. at point church west wake or you can check out a service on the facebook page first if you like right now we're streaming stuff before you come or you can go to any of our spanish services they're on sundays but they're in the afternoons so mm -hmm. most we have one at two we had one one thirty we have one at four thirty i mean and even just listening to to people with diverse backgrounds i mean just listening to this podcast i think it's a, a good way to get to know other cultures and other realities yeah. and all also, even things like sports, you can play soccer. I play soccer with people from all over the world, just on Meetup, look on Meetup, and or you can find something that uh, interests you, another group like music or food. Or, but getting involved in something that's not gonna just happen, it's something that you have to be intentional. And so, mm -hmm. but the most important thing I would say is is to pray and that God will guide you mm -hmm. in that because. Jesus said that we have not because we ask not. And so the best thing is to ask specifically to the Spirit of God who is active in and through us that that he draws to, to people, to guide us to people that are just waiting to hear the gospel and no matter where they're from and specifically pray that it, they're internationals and that they're people that are different from us. And God will do that. Mm -hmm. I mean... God will respond to that because he's the first one interested mm -hmm. in that no one perishes, that yes. everyone hears the good news. Yeah. One last question. So we're all exposed today to mega churches, and we can see that a lot of mega churches are taking an international shift. God is bringing whites and blacks and internationals together in the same worship services and in the same community outreach and the same small groups and the list goes on and on and on and and so most americans don't necessarily attend uh, a very large mega church they attend small churches and so i want you to just speak to that leader of a church that is rep that is dominantly representing one particular culture one one nationality Maybe it's a Spanish culture, maybe it's an English culture, but they're looking over that and they, they're like, okay, we have a great gospel ministry. What we're saying today, what you're sharing is not what you've been doing is wrong and you've got mm -hmm. to, no. you got to cut ties with that and go build an international church. It's just a, an encouragement to realize, praise God for what he's put in your hand, but trust him for more. So you lead a dominantly specific culture, uh, church, uh, you're ministering to a specific uh, people group. That's great. Praise God. But realize the gospel you've been given is for everyone. So mm -hmm. what if God wants to bring a Spanish ministry to this English church? What if he wants to bring an, a, a Hindi ministry to this Spanish church? Mm -hmm. uh, and we can keep blending over and over and over. What mm -hmm. would you say to that leader? Well, first of all, thank you for that question. Thank, first of all, I would say thank you for doing the work of the gospel. Thank you for what you're doing. And second, that our the local church is really the the hope of the world. I mean, we're seeing it now. We're seeing it right now in in the in the state we're in that that the church is being the salt and light and the hope of the world. So, I I pray that that you know as a leader that God has put you there for a reason. There's there's no accident that you're there. And so in order to be the hope of the world in your local, as a local church, in your local community, really, we have to reflect our community. So, I mean, I think the first thing is getting to know our community a little better, maybe, and just seeing what's around, seeing maybe some aspects of or some parts of our community that are different from, mm -hmm. from what's represented at, at your church. So getting to know what's around is, is important. And then trying to build relationships with churches that are around you that are may have a different ethnic origin or language than you. I think that's what I've done. My dad has done. Chris is really good at this, is building relationships and, and sitting down with those leaders and expressing that you would love to collaborate because collaboration really 
speeds up multiplication of the gospel. So oh, let's let's see what we can do together. Let's partner up and see where I can help you, where you can help us to to be more the church that that God dreamed for us to be. And so forming relationships is it's an important step. And then yeah, sharing meals, starting to to dream together about what God could do with with us as as partners and never be satisfied because God is God is huge. Yes. God can do so much more than we could ever think or imagine according to the riches of his glory. So mm-hmm. if we trust him and if we're intentional, God will do it. And I, I can't wait to see so many churches reflecting their communities and really being the salt and light of the world. It's not easy. Right. It's not easy because it takes, like I said before, a breaking of of a lot of things that we have been taken for mm-hmm. granted. But I feel like if you have been called as a leader to our, your local church, God has equipped you with the Holy Spirit inside you and yeah. he will empower you with so many things. He will speak on your behalf. He will be behind you and he will right. uh, equip you in the ways that you need to be equipped to to be bastion for his glory. David, thank you so much. Uh, you're championing exactly what this podcast is all about. Does your church's demographic represent the demographic in your community? Mm-hmm. And if not, trust God for more. I love your statement there. Collaboration speeds up multiplication for the gospel. So let's collaborate. Let's allow God to change the demographics in our church. David, thank you so much. I I want this to be one of many conversations that we have. You're teaching me so much and I love you, my brother. And I just pray God blessing over you and Pastor Chris and the Point Church. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me. And may God bless your work too, as you continue to champion this cause and help people hear stories that will inspire them. Yes. Amen. Thanks, David. God bless. Thank you. We're giving away a Starbucks gift card this month to one of our amazing listeners. Go to globalhopeindia.org slash dream and fill out the quick free Starbucks form. We will randomly select a lucky listener. So enter now for your chance to win. This episode is complete, so head over to globalhopeindia.org for show notes and more resources for your success. Continue to find your strategy for reaching your community and changing the world here at Living the Dream.